The next speaker, Dr. Fischer, is he here? Yeah? Okay. So. I think we will make a switch a little bit back uh, to the morning session. And we will listen to something like high resolution microscopy, optical microscopy. I it's would okay. say, but still uh, we want to see some uh, true nanometer resolution. Two so 25. Yeah, true. It's true. true. Okay, true right, nanometer. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand two. <laughs> no, no, true, true <laughs> nanometer. So that means uh, really below 100 nanometers. So the floor is yours. Yeah. Yes. So thank you for the introduction and. Um, I, um, uh, yes, can you do that full screen? Yes, right. Um, I mean, you have all um, heard about uh, stimulated emission, simulated emission depletion microscopy um, this morning in the plenary talk. And um, I work at the Barrier Instruments, um, which is actually co founded by um, Professor Hell that you've heard. And I also come up with this Nobel Prize poster. So, here it is in a nutshell, while a usual laser scanning confocal microscope on the left hand side, and I think the pointer is empty, or, yeah. Um, you have a single laser beam focused through an objective lens and you raster scan a fluorescently labeled sample. Um, in contrast, the STET microscope has at least a second laser beam that is ring shaped in the, in the, in the image plane, and the second laser beam uh, does enhance the resolution by um, switching on and off the, the molecules, as you've heard before. And um, the outcome uh, looks like this. So on the left-hand side, you have a, a confocal fluorescence image. On the right-hand side, a stat image. And you see a dramatic increase uh, in resolution here. Um, and also, like uh, Stefan told you, the, the actual picture on the Nobel Prize poster is uh, done with an Aberio Instruments machine. So um, we, are, uh, we hope we are not only close to research um, grade performance, but we are really at the cutting edge, at least resolution wise. And once more on the left hand side, you can see we see uh, it's nuclear pore complexes uh, and you can see actually nothing on the, on the right hand side. You can see um, that the anchor uh, has this eightfold symmetry and uh, you can nicely resolve much more details. And um, as I said, there are two laser beams. One laser beam um, is the, the one that you also have in the confocals. And if you add a second laser beam that is ring-shaped, you can switch off the molecules in the periphery of, of, every, of every point you detect. And by increasing the laser power, you can successively increase the resolution. And finally, you uh, may end up with a 22 nanometers resolution or like uh, similar numbers uh, compared to 250 nanometers in a confocal imaging. And um, our microscope platform that you can also have a look at um, in, the, in the hall down there, we have one working microscope standing there, um, has excellent resolution, as I said, and it's very, very modular and uh, can also be tailored to your, uh, to your needs. It can be confocal, it can be stat resolved. Um, you can choose from seven exact lasers. We have uh, time-gated detection in all systems. It can also be combined with fluorescent lifetime imaging and we have a full software control of the, even of the microscope stand. You can also remote control our software from other software environments if it's necessary. And uh, what I want to talk about uh, today is a bit the, the last two points, which is our easy 3D module um, and uh, the, the rescue approach for reducing the light stress on samples. So. Um, most of the time, uh, STET microscopy is done only um, by enhancing resolution in X and Y direction. So you have um, this donut-shaped uh, second laser beam that improves the resolution in X and Y. And um, the Z resolution is actually the same as in the confocal. And that's, as we know, it's uh, even worse than the XY resolution. So it's highly uh, favorable to, to also improve the Z resolution. And there is another kind of stat beam that you can use for that. And usually you want to combine both X, Y, and Z. And we have a beam shaping module based on a, a spatial light modulator, which it does this in a quite clever way. Usually you divide 
one beam into two, you make one beam the donut beam and the other one the so-called bottle beam for the set and then you recombine the beams and this is of course again very alignment sensitive and we um, use a single beam, we prepare a polarization state um, that can be rotated um, at will and then one polarization is uh, imprinted the donut and the other polarization is made the bottle beam without uh, ever uh, dividing those two beams so uh, there is no no chance for any misalignment in this thing so we have unmatched stability and we can program this spatial light modulator um, correct um, aberrations and maybe quite importantly you can with this progr programmable faceplate you can use any objective lens um, for the 3D imaging. Um, ideally the outcome looks like this so you have on the left hand side a confocal point spread function of a nanoparticle um, uh, in, in XY slice on the right hand side you have a 3D stat um, image of the same particle um, with uh, greatly improved resolution. And maybe the thing about objective lenses is that um, uh, while usually the oil immersion lenses are the most powerful lenses that you can get, um, it's uh, not clever to use them all the time. For example, if you have a, a water sample or something, um, we have done this test here. So this is a sandwich of two, two cover uh, slides with uh, fluorescent beads on both slides with water in between. And if you use an oil lens on the left-hand side, you can see that the beads that are closest to the microscope uh, objective are very bright and detailed and on the other cover slip you can hardly see anything and this is simply due to chromatic aberrations um, no spherical aberrations induced by the mismatch in refractive index and therefore it's much more clever of course to use a, a water um, objective in this case and then you have a nice and bright and high resolution um, image of both slides um, in both in confocal and in stat mode and this is made possible and the, the face pattern needs to be adapted to, to every objective lens so our programmable um, beam shaper allows to use any objective lens um, that, you, that you may need for your sample. And um, for some examples maybe, so these are mitochondria which uh, are about 300 nanometers in diameter. So in the confocal you can actually see only uh, solid, solid fibers or something and on the right hand side with the improved Z resolution or X, Y, and Z resolution you can nicely see that the labeled protein is actually on the surface of the mitochondrium and that it's uh, kind of hollow tubes uh, in, in, this, in this view. And um, this can also be done in multicolor. So here is the, um, again the membrane of the mitochondria and mitochondrial DNA labeled in uh, green and red. And if you uh, do the same thing instead, you see a greatly improved detail in the, in the image. Um, that thing that looks quite nice. Yes, um, and the second thing I wanted to talk about is um, uh, what we can do about live cell imaging. And uh, live cell imaging is, of course, uh, important, but uh, very channel challenging from, from optics and label um, points of view. And one thing that we have, um, commercialized now is um, a method called rescue which is a intelligent laser switching scheme that um, tries to avoid unnecessary uh, light exposure to uh, to the samples so usually in we have the excitation spot here we have additionally the donut spot and if you raster scan your sample all the lasers are on all the time and you see we cross uh, structures here and they are exposed and stressed potentially photo bleached or uh, um, uh, triggering phototoxic reactions although there is no, nothing to image actually because the, the, the imaging volume in the middle the small uh, sphere small circle is actually always empty and only at this point now when we cross the structure we have actually some information recorded and the rescue scheme now uh, subdivides every pixel dwell time into uh, different time steps and in the first time step we do a short very short confocal image and decide whether there is something in the confocal image. And if there is nothing in confocal image, we immediately switch off the laser again. Um, if we see something in the confocal image like now, then we switch on the stat beam. Now we have the higher resolution of the stat method. And again, we ask, is there something in the stat volume, in the, in the smaller volume that we now um, are acquiring? And again, we don't find anything in that volume. And only if uh, we have in the second check now have something 
have account, account number above a certain threshold that we can define, only then we decide to switch on the lasers for the rest of the pixel, and um, the, only in these pixels the, the sample is fully, fully stressed or fully exposed to the light dose that you would usually always have, and after the sample, again, we are only, do only check. Um, clearly, this induces some thresholding, um, but um, there you can reduce the, 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 the light exposure by factors of 5 to 25, say, and that's certainly very useful in lifestyle imaging, and also if you're considering doing um, fixed uh, set stacks, uh, you will also, I mean, every, every stack layer you take um, does not only expose and bleach the layer you are looking at, but all the layers above and below nearly um, to the same extent. So in this case, it's really, um, uh, and does really save you lots of, uh, lots of light and photo bleaching. And um, as a result, uh, here is some, the same cell on the left and the right side uh, imaged uh, once with a conventional stat below, which is, also, which is already pulsed stat, so if you would do continuous wave stat, it would be even worse likely. And on the upper side, you have this rescue stat, and uh, clearly the photo bleaching is greatly reduced at the same resolution, um, yeah, at the same resolution. And to show you that it, we can also combine this with the other things I showed you, this is a rescue 3D stat two-color image of the of a nucleus, the nuclear pore complex in green and lamina in red. And these are simply two different uh, set layers. So on the left-hand side, you can nicely see that um, that you only see the outer rim of of the nucleus uh, that is possible due to the improved set resolution that we have. Yeah, and. Finally, a small movie that is actually going over three hours. So, um, right, this is a primary human fibroblast uh, labeled with uh, silicon rhodamine. So, tubulin is labeled with sil silicon rhodamine, and this is then uh, imaged over three hours. And to wrap it up, um, we offer STET high super resolution micros microscopes. They are very modular, upgradable, and extendable. So, you can at every time upgraded some features that maybe even come up in, in future. Um, we have this um, 3D uh, approach with the programmable beam shaping device that allows you to use any objective lens and rescues that may uh, reduce unnecessary light exposure in your, in your experiments. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Maybe you can uh, say something about the prices. It's heavily depending on the equipment you, you want to have. Um, as I said, it's very modular, but uh, a well-equipped machine, I think, is about 500 kilo euro. Okay. Uh, I believe. <laughs> I, I, I'm not perfectly sure. I mean, I'm, I'm an engineer. So it's a <laughs> six-digit uh, amount, isn't it? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Any question from the audience? Uh, frankly, to say, out of my curiosity as well as ignorance, and uh, excuse my asking this basic question. So we need two laser beams with separate wavelength. Mm. I can understand the selection of the first laser, which can you know excite the, uh, the molecules. Mm. And what's the uh, selection rule of the second laser uh, wavelength? The selection rule: how you select the laser, or, or the yeah. Um, okay, usually the second laser, um, it induces stimulated emission to de-excite the molecules. Therefore, the wavelength must be in the fluorescence band. So uh, it's in the fluorescence band. And usually you um, choose it to be in the last third or the, the red most third or, um, of the fluorescence band in order to avoid that the, the STAT laser does actually excite the molecule. You do not want to excite it, you want to de-excite it. Therefore, you go to the red, because otherwise you would have some overlap with the, with the, um, excite or with the absorption spectrum. And, um, and finally, you detect fluorescence in a certain band, and th that is in between the two lasers. So you have to filter out the STAT laser with some dichroic filters. So yeah, it's... Excitation is in the absorption maximum. The stat laser is in the red third of the fluorescence, and you detect in between. The, the, um, yeah, the, you, I mean, you need this ring shape. You need this donut, and this is this is actually done by putting um, some face mask element in the beam, and to make a right to make a donut. Right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 
Okay, I see there's no more question and we have to continue to the last talk of our session. And we uh, thank the speaker again.